according to joined seventy two others and sent them out ahead of him in pairs to all the towns and villages he himself was to visit. He said to them, The harvest is rich, but the laborers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers to his harvest. Start off now, but remember, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Carry no purse, no have a sack, no sandals. Salute no one on the road. Whatever house you go into, let your first words be peace to this house. And if a man of peace lives there, your peace will go and rest on him. If not, it will come back to you. Stay in the same house, taking what food and drink they have to offer, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not move from house to house. Whenever you go into a town where they make you welcome, eat what is set before you. Cure those in it who are sick and say, The kingdom of God is very near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not make you welcome, go out into its streets and say, We wipe off the very dust of your town that clings to our feet and leave it with you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is very near. I tell you, on that day, it will not go as hard with Sodom as with that town. The seventy-two came back rejoicing. Lord, they said, even the devil submit to us when we use your name. He said to them, I watched Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Yes, I have given you power to dread underfoot serpents and scorpions and the whole strength of the enemy. Nothing shall ever hurt you, yet do not rejoice at the spirit submit to you. Rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear God's family, dear brothers and sisters, it is now over a hundred and probably 130 years since the first Catholic missionaries arrived in Eastern Africa. Elderly people among us will remember how in our Christian community the original enthusiasm of the early days was followed by periods of discouragement. In fact, most communities followed a similar pattern as follows. First, there was great enthusiasm when we embraced the faith. Happiness filled our hearts, and unable to restrain it, we tried every possible means to share it with others by leading them into the faith. We were few in number, but lived our faith in sincerity and joy in spite of ignorance and human weakness. Our joy increased as new members joined the community. Our church building was a hatched shed, yet there we gathered Sunday after Sunday, happy at the thought that we were joining thousands of other Catholic communities around the world, who like us and with us praised God on the Lord's day. Our joy knew no bounds when once or twice a year a priest visited our village. Practically everyone received the sacraments on that occasion. But then gradually our enthusiasm dimmed. Quarrels and divisions started among us. We became less regular in attending the Holy Eucharist and the Holy Mass. We were more cold uh, or shy or we were not as enthusiastic as before. Uh, during the last 20 years or so, things among us have improved remarkably as far as material progress is concerned. We enjoy today more comfortable housing, better roads, medical attention, and so on. Many among us have joined government service. Money is more easily available than in the past, and we are now in a position to educate our children. But this material prosperity has not been accompanied by an improvement in Christian life. On the contrary, 
The old honesty of our ancestors has vanished. Morality has declined sharply. More and more families are breaking up. And the scourge of drugs and alcohol is causing havoc among our young people. This picture may appear too gloomy to some, but most of us will agree that it corresponds to reality. Is there a remedy to our lack of Christian enthusiasm today, a way to recover our original fervor? Yes, for that we must start by having a clear idea of what it means to be Christian. And secondly, we must once again become God's messengers to everyone around us. The joy of Christian life will increase within us to the extent to which we share our faith with others. St. Paul had to suffer greatly on account of some Jews who, having become Christians, went around disturbing the peace of his communities, insisting that the Christians who had been pagans before had to observe the law of Moses, the law of circumcision in particular, in order to be saved. A large section of Christians in a region called Galatia had been misled by these false teachers, and Paul wrote to them a very strong letter to help them free themselves from these false teachers. This Sunday's second reading contains the conclusion to that letter. Normally, Paul used to dictate his letters to a secretary, but in today's second reading, he tells his Christians of Galatia that he is writing the conclusion in his own hand and urges them to pay particular attention to it, for it sums up the content of the letter. And the following are the main points of that conclusion. First, to be a Christian means to have become an altogether a new creature on account of the life in the Spirit or the Holy Spirit given to us at baptism. It is this life in the Spirit, divine life, the sanctifying grace that really matters. All the rest, to perform this or that ceremony or to keep this or that rule counts little. In other words, he is a Christian who maintains and increases his life in the Spirit within himself. Paul says this in the following words. Secondly, the marks of my body are the marks of Jesus. At the time of Paul, some masters branded their slaves with red hot iron, as we do with the cattle today. A runaway slave could thus be identified by that mark and be sent back to his master. St. Paul says that Christ had spiritually marked him with his own sign, namely the sign of the cross. It is not a sign of shame or of slavery, but of glory and of true freedom. Jesus saved us through the cross, and Christians should show who their master is by embracing their own cross, that is, by courageously bearing their own sufferings for the sake of Christ. Finally, Paul wishes peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, that is, to all who keep faithful to Christ. We could not have a more kind master than Christ. St. Paul invites his Christians to give themselves totally to him. This is the only way to experience Christ's own joy and peace, to give ourselves totally to him. Half-hearted Christians reach nowhere. Christ's joy is reserved only to those who belong totally to Christ. He is a Christian, in summary, who maintains rigorously the divine life in his own heart, the sanctifying grace in his own heart, who sides with Christ decidedly, no matter the cost, and who deeply shares Christ's peace and joy. All the three evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, narrate how Jesus sent his twelve apostles on pre a preaching to, to prepare the people for his own coming. But only Luke narrates that Jesus sent also 72 disciples on a similar mission, as we have read in today's Gospel. There is no reason to doubt that Jesus sent the two groups, 
though the similarities between the two missions made some people believe there had been a single sending of the disciples. Luke narrates both missions for a purpose, to show that the good news was to be communicated not only to the people of Israel, but to all nations, and communicated not only by the apostles, but by every disciple of his. Luke conveys this message by playing with the numbers, so to say, something very common in Holy Scripture. Number 12, the number of the apostles, stands in the mind of Luke for the 12 tribes of Israel and who in God's plan were to be evangelized first. Number 72 instead, 6 times 12, stands for the 72 tribes or clans listed in chapter 10 of the book of Genesis, the complete list as the Jews thought of all the tribes living in the world at that time. In the mind of Luke, then, the sending of the 72 disciples is a sign that contrary to what the Jews of his time thought, all the nations were to be evangelized. The gospel had to be preached to everyone. <clears throat> but without fear of being mistaken, we could also give to the numbers 12 and 72 another meaning. The 12 apostles whom Jesus first sent, represent not only the apostles, but their successors as well, the Pope, the bishops, and the priests, all those special messengers chosen by God, all those uh, carrying out the ordained ministry about whom we spoke last Sunday. The 72 disciples instead would represent all the baptized, each one of us, all young people, our catechists, our men, our women, we all are called to Christ to spread the good news, to prepare for him the way into the hearts of people. This is a duty imposed on us all on receiving the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. That, this is what we mean when we say that our church must be a missionary church. God wants our community to be at all times a missionary community. Only by leading others to Christ shall we recover the joy and enthusiasm of all early days. Now, we need to ask another important question. Whom are we called to evangelize? Most of us will never leave our village or town we cannot abandon our families and go to foreign countries to preach the gospel. We need not do it. The people around us are a field washed enough for us to evangelize. We are called to evangelize each other within the Christian community. Parents are called to evangelize their children and children their parents. Husbands are called to evangelize their wives and wives, their husbands, brothers, sisters, and relatives are called to evangelize each other. Young people are called to evangelize fellow young people. In a word, each member of the community is called to evangelize the rest. This is not a dream. We must lead the members of both, the family of the flesh and the family in the faith, to an ever greater faithfulness to Christ. We all need help because we all are weak. We all need encouragement since we are so often tempted to be discouraged. We must extend a helping hand to those fallen into sin. And we in turn need a helping hand to rise up from sin when fallen into it. We must also evangelize our non-Catholic brethren. Some among them belong to our family. We live side by side with others in the village. How can we be indifferent to the fact that some who have not yet accepted Christ, while others, those belonging to other denominations, Christian denominations, do not know yet the complete truth about Jesus Christ? Christ urges us to be concerned at all times about the salvation of everyone around us. Obviously, we shall lead them to Christ not so much through long speeches, but through our example, our genuine Christian life. 
Yet we must strive to know our faith better every day so as to be in a position to provide anyone with a ready and courteous answer when questioned about it, as St. Peter wrote to his Christians, at all times be ready to give an answer to the hope that you have in you. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Now, next question is, what kind of messengers does God or Jesus want us to be? What is he expecting to us? First of all, he wants us to be determined, to be serious. Salute no one on the road. Salute no one on the roads. Don't say jumbo. Uh, in other words, uh, do not get distracted from your work and do not miss an opportunity to take Christ into the hearts of the people. Secondly, he wants us not to put our trust in human means. Carry no purse, he says. Carry no purse. That is, contrary to what we are often led to believe, neither money nor human power nor human learning is really needed to bring people to Christ. What is really needed is the love that you have for Christ and the example of a truly Christian life. And then... Finally, Christ wants us to be messengers of peace and love. We must carry peace in our hearts. Peace be to this house. Christ's messengers must be peace givers and peacemakers at all times. We cannot share peace unless the peace of Christ, Holy Spirit, reigns within us and among the members of the Christian community. Only God knows how many more people would today belong to our Christian community if it were not for our quarrels, our divisions, our enmities. And then Christ does not want us to lose courage in our work. When they do not receive you in a place, he says, go to another. We should never get tired, discouraged, never lose courage, never. God wants us to try and try again, just as he himself does. The person who rejected us yesterday might accept us today. It is true that in today's gospel, Jesus tells his disciples to shake off the dust from their feet when leaving a village which refuses to listen to the good news. But we must understand Jesus' words well. He means to say that those who reject the gospel do so at their own risk. You don't have to blame yourself because they rejected the gospel. Really, it is their fault. Such people will be answerable to the Lord and not to us. Our work is to go on in our effort to lead people to Christ. When rejected, we should not get discouraged. We must increase our efforts all the more. St. Luke tells us that after completing their task, the disciples came back to Jesus beaming with joy at the thought that the evil spirits had submitted to them when they, uh, they commanded in his name to set people free from their dominion. We should derive two important lessons from this detail. First, Bringing people to Christ increases within us the joy of belonging to him. Secondly, Jesus will see to it that those who strive to set people free from the slavery of the devil will in turn be given the strength they need to overcome the devil in temptation. So I repeat, when we do this work of the gospel, when we lead people to Christ, we will experience tremendous joy in our heart and we ourselves will be protected from the evil one. Jesus invited his disciples to rejoice because their names were written in heaven. Our names too are written there. There is no danger of Jesus missing the name of anyone who leads people to him. Let us strive therefore to from our families, from our homes, from our friends, we shall experience then multiplied a hundredfold joy of our early days as Christians. And so we pray, Father in heaven, we thank you for having sent your Son to bring us peace and joy. Help us to be faithful messengers at all times, that we may totally belong to him in time and eternity. He who lives and reigns with you, 
forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus, save